of New Hampshire. Um, I will be the moderator of the session today. Um, but before we start, uh, let me remind a few housekeeping rules to ensure that we have a smooth and productive session. Um, as an attendee, you are muted and cannot share your screen during the presentations. If you have a question, please ask them in the chat or the Q&A section so our panelists can see them. Our team is monitoring both chat and the Q&A, and we will make sure the questions are answered. When we reach the discussion section of the webinar, we invite you to raise your hand, look for a hand symbol or emoji on your screen, hit that button, and then we will uh, notify you. You will be given the mic to ask your question live. So today's webinar is set with two presentations followed by a discussion with our panelists. So with no further ado, let me introduce the first presenter, Dr. Ferrini, who is the head of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans Region Center for the Nippon Foundation JEPCO CIBET 2030 project. In her presentation, we will hear about the goals of these webinars and an introduction to the Nippon Foundation JEPCO CIBET 2030 project. Uh, a quick reminder, Keep your, keep your mic muted and your video off. For our panelists, uh, you will be given the right to speak and to share your video when your turn is on. So please, Vicky, go ahead with your presentation. All right, thank you, Tina. Um, I wanted to remind everyone also that we are recording this um, and we plan to post uh, at least the presentation portions online for people to access after. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to uh, speak with you and tell you about this project and really start to build a stronger community around Africa um, to help work toward the common goals of mapping the seafloor. Uh, before I get into the presentation about Seabed 2030, just a quick review of the goals of the webinar series. Um, we want to make sure that we introduce the Seabed 2030 project to you and to discuss the common goals of Seabed 2030 and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. There's a lot of synergy between those projects and it's a very exciting opportunity, I think, to really accelerate toward our common goals. We really also want to understand the needs of stakeholders in the region with respect to bathymetry, with respect to technology, workflows, approaches. Um, you know, the goals of the Seabed 2030 project are to create a complete map of the ocean, but really to do this through engaging a productive community that works together um, to reach these common goals. And uh, we want to really work toward developing collaborative relationships and make sure that what we're doing is mutually beneficial. So uh, the agenda for today, as Tina mentioned, is an introduction to CIPA 2030. We're going to hear some perspectives from UNESCO IOC Africa, and then we're going to have a discussion with regional stakeholders. And we certainly welcome um, all of you to ask questions and um, learn more about what uh, what we're trying to do here and how you can be part of it. So an introduction to the Seabed 2030 project. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge our team. We are the Atlantic and Indian Ocean Regional Center. We are based at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in New York. So we're not all there right now because of COVID. Uh, I've listed the team members here. Many of these, most of these people are on the call today with us and uh, you'll see them pop in and out hopefully. Um, but really this is a massive effort that we're undertaking and uh, it's really all about bringing people together and bringing skills together to help achieve this as a community. So what is Seabed 2030? Well, it is uh, the Nippon Foundation JEBCO Seabed 2030 project is a collaborative project that's really intended to inspire the complete mapping of the world's ocean by the year 2030 and to compile all bathymetric data into the freely available JEBCO ocean map, which you can see pictured on the bottom of this slide here. 
CBED 2030 aspires to empower the world to make policy decisions, to use the ocean sustainably, and to undertake scientific research that's informed by a detailed understanding of the global ocean floor. So it really recognizes that the global ocean floor is a shared global resource and uh, a, a common space that we all have an investment in. And so really trying to make that um, better understood so that we can manage and uh, understand it. So why is Seabed 2030 important? Uh, I think the first, one of the most compelling reasons is that bathymetry data is an essential ocean observation. The map that's shown on the bottom here shows the extent of coverage from um, the latest public release of the JEBCO grid. And the areas that are covered in black indicate places where there is no or very little data. So little that when you're zoomed at global scale, you can't see, uh, see the, the data at this resolution. So having a map is a very important first step in a lot of things that happen in the ocean. And so if we can actually come together to build a, um, a, a community data set, really, uh, we can really have tremendous benefit on a lot of different activities. Um, seabed mapping data has it's a very broad use and value to a wide variety of um, activities. I think it's important to acknowledge also that ocean processes extend beyond territorial waters, right? The ocean is one. So really having the continuity of information um, is critical to understand processes that happen in one location. We have to understand what's happening in adjacent areas. At present, our best estimate is that only 20% of the ocean has been mapped with direct observation. I should put a, a little bit of detail there that that's based on the data that's integrated into the JEBCO map. We do know that there is more data that exists that has not yet been made available or has not yet been integrated. So that's a piece that we're working on and I will explain some more about that shortly. Um, and again, this is a really important point. Mapping the entire ocean is a massive task that can only be achieved through cooperation and coordination. A single project, a single group, a single country can't do this alone. It's, it's huge and it really relies on everyone coming together. And I think one of the things that really inspires me as well is that since the ocean covers so much of our planet, we don't have a complete map of our planet. So having uh, the opportunity to create for the first time a complete map of our planet is extremely exciting. So CBED 2030 is pursuing a regional approach. Um, we've established four regional centers they're, co they're called RDACs, Regional Data Assembly and Coordination, a real emphasis on that um, particular, those activities. Our jobs in these regional centers are to engage with stakeholders like yourselves, to really build upon existing efforts. We don't want to re redo things that are already underway. We don't wanna stop things that are underway. We wanna work together so that we can move more quickly by joining forces. Uh, we do the technical work of assembling regional products, and a very important thing that we're doing is we're identifying gaps in data coverage so that we can inform new data acquisition. So the four regions that CBED 2030 has established are represented in the map that's shown here. The green region uh, shows the extent of the Atlantic and Indian Ocean Center, which we are um, stewarding. Uh, so that is, as I said, based at Columbia University. Uh, the color on top, on the top of the map for the Arctic and the North Pacific is uh, that region is jointly um, handled by Stockholm University and the University of New Hampshire. The Southern Ocean is um, handled by the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. And then the part that shows up in red is the South and West Pacific Regional Centers area. And that's based in New Zealand at the National Institutes of Water and Atmosphere in collaboration with two other organizations there, GNS and LINS. Um, there is also a global center, um, which is based in the UK at NOC. It's the yellow dot on this map. And the global center's job is to assemble the regional pieces that we put together and to make and distribute the global map and all of the supporting information that goes with it. So we are a geographically spread out team. Um, a lot of these groups have done a lot of work in the space of global ocean mapping. And so we're able to bring that expertise and knowledge to bear to help really 
set up the infrastructure and the framework for this project to flourish. As I mentioned, it's very important that we collaborate with existing efforts. Um, and I have here just a slide showing some of the existing data synthesis efforts that fall within the region that we are looking after. So um, there's a big effort underway in Australia. There's a big effort underway in the European Union. Uh, there's an effort that we run at Columbia University that has been assembling mostly US academic data. Um, and we're also finding compilations of data coming from different nations. So I have an example here from Brazil. They've actually built a digital terrain model and provided that to us as a core data set to help us better um, represent the shape of the seafloor and their waters. So I have this graphic of the of the, the machine sort of turning the wheels. The way that I think about this is there are national efforts that are underway. If national efforts can come together, that helps to drive regional efforts, and then the regional efforts drive the global. It's really all cumulative, um, and hopefully that helps us gain efficiencies. So a very common question, of course, is what does 100% mapped mean? Um, and so we published a paper a few years ago um, that defined things, and basically using a ship-based multi-beam system and the geometry of that kind of system, we did a computation based on water depth of what kind of uh, resolution would be achievable based on the geometry uh, and the sampling resolution of those systems. And really the goal here was to put some, um, some framework in place so that we had a goal to work toward. Of course, I think we all are interested in seeing the seafloor in tremendous detail, and it is possible to get, you know, sub-meter resolution in some parts of the deep sea, for example. But if we have a, a goal that is so extreme, the ability to reach it in such a short time is going to be even more difficult. So our depth resolution goal targets or uh, resolution targets are shown here. Basically, for water shallower than 1500 meters, we're seeking data density of one sounding per 100 meter square. Uh, as we move into deeper water, that becomes 200 meters, 400 meters, and 800 meters. And what you can see in the map that's shown here is that the vast majority of the ocean falls in the 400 meter resolution zone. So uh, it's a little bit complicated, but I think it's also a fairly rational way of approaching this so that we have some achievable goals um, to work toward. So accelerating toward 2030, I think this is something I, I think about a lot. A really important piece of this, as I've alluded to, is collaboration and capacity development, really learning from each other, sharing workflows and approaches, tools, obviously sharing data, figuring out how to work together and how to bring all the different sectors in the maritime community together to leverage efforts and meet this goal is a critical piece of how we uh, hope to achieve our, our goals. Um, there's crowdsourcing, there's capacity development, all these things are very important to this. Uh, also, of course, accelerating toward 2030 will rely tremendously on technical innovation. And the way that I like to think about this is from the perspective of data acquisition and sharing. So ways to acquire data more quickly, less expensively, autonomous platforms, for example, uh, crowdsourced bathymetry, and really opening up barriers to data sharing and making that data more quickly readily available so it can be worked on and synthesized into data products. That's one piece. And then the other piece has to do with computing and data processing. How can we speed up that effort, which is time consuming and still requires a lot of human intervention? Transmitting the data quickly from at sea assets to the cloud is part of that. There's a lot of things happening simultaneously in both of these spaces that will surely help accelerate us as uh, a global community toward this important goal. Very briefly, because I believe this will be discussed after, um, the UN Decade of Ocean Science is a tremendous opportunity for us as a global community to meet a lot of goals with respect to the ocean and sustainable development. Um, recognizing the importance of a map for the goals of the UN Decade is a huge um, uh, force multiplier. So we really hope that by 
pursuing common goals, having assets at sea to acquire data that cross cuts different disciplines. I think this will be a really important accelerator um, as we move through the next decade. And it's really, really exciting. I just want to briefly give you a little information about how to access data, because I think it's important if you don't know how to find the data. Um, I'm hoping to, to fix that now. Um, the JEBCO products themselves are available from the JEBCO website and also the CBED 2030 website. Um, in 2014, right before the project started, the JEBCO grid was 30 arc second resolution. We've increased that. So the last two releases of the grid are 15 arc second. So we've increased the resolution. Other JEBCO products for you to be aware of are the Gazetteer of Undersea Feature Names, the, there's a digital atlas, there's grid viewing software, printable maps, a web map service, and a cookbook. So JEBCO has been in place for over 100 years. It operates under the auspices of the IOC and the International Hydrographic Organization, the IHO. And so there's a lot of um, existing infrastructure and resources because of JEBCO that um, are brought to bear for the CBED 2030 project. Um, if you go to the website to download the grid, you can either download the entire uh, global grid or you can select an area and download a piece of the grid. Um, there, it's available in a variety of formats, so um, trying to make sure that people can access it however they need to. Um, another very important um, aspect of the work of JEBCO and of CBED 2030 is that the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry serves as um, the international repository for deep water ocean bathymetry data. And so the idea here is if we can route data into the DCDB, it becomes available for a variety of uses, not just the JEBCO and CBA 2030 projects, but everyone's projects that are, they're trying to do different resolution products, et cetera. And so this is the route that um, a lot of data is already going, and it's a best practice that we uh, encourage, though we recognize that not everyone is able to contribute in this way, and that's just fine. We have to recognize what people are able to do. Um, but we're also very fortunate to have this um, you know, recognized repository to support us with the data repository efforts and preservation for the long term. Uh, very briefly, when you come into the DCDB website, you can um, come into a viewer and what you'll find in here is not only the data that is served and, and managed inside that repository, which in this case is shown in green, but there are services from distributed data repositories from different nations that are also shown in here. So we're really trying to bring information together from everyone in the world that has information to share about the existence of bathymetry data and put it on the map so we have a more complete picture. So again, this is an, a great example of data that's not inside the DCDB, but is still accessible and discoverable through its viewer. Uh, so I think this is the last section of my talk, just to give you a sense of where we are um, with respect to mapping in this region as of the JEBCO 2020 grid, which was released last year. We're in the process of building a new grid for 2021, which will be released in a few months, but this is based on what's publicly available. So for a quick comparison, the JEBCO 2014 grid is on the left and the JEBCO 2020 grid is on the right. Again, we're using black here to basically hide the parts of the map that are based on prediction or interpolation so that we can emphasize where data exist. Um, so you can see there are a lot of gaps, um, but we've also made some good progress with um, some recent contributions of multi-beam data that have helped to fill in the map in this region. If we were to zoom in uh, in a dynamic interface, which is what these images were captured from, you would see much more detail um, and there would be little dots here and there that help to break up the black. It's not quite as data sparse as it looks at this resolution. So as we try to consider the question of how much of the region has actually been mapped, we have to bring together not just the data coverage that's in the JEBCO 2020 grid, which is shown on the left here, but we have to also consider known existing data that has either not yet been shared or has not yet been integrated. And that's what's shown in the right map here. So this is a case where we've overlain the web services 
of other repositories that have made it known that data exist. Um, some of that data is readily available. Some of it is a little bit harder to get access to. Um, that's a barrier that we aspire to, um, to break down so that we can work together to make that data available. Um, there's other pieces of data that we know exist that have been acquired but can't be shared for other reasons. So they're not public, but they're still on the map as uh, known data to exist. And so at least having this information on the map helps us better constrain the parts of the map that have no data. And so the idea there is that we can use seagoing assets more effectively to map new areas that have not been mapped instead of remapping areas that have been mapped, but the data just has not yet been shared. And there's a question here because it's likely that there's more existing data that we don't even have any representation on the map for. And that's a place where I think we can make good progress relatively quickly if we can get people to um, give us information, make available information about data that might someday be able to be shared so that we can put it on the map and better constrain where the gaps are. So known existing data is a combination of data that's at the IHO DCDB, other public data in distributed repositories. And most of this is actively being integrated into CBED 2030 products. Um, the non-public data, we certainly look to stakeholders around the world for um, input on how to develop a strategy to promote data sharing. What are the terms that people are comfortable with to be able to come to the table and share something? Is it a lower resolution gridded version that would be okay to share? That would be fine to contribute. Um, you know, what is it that would help bring everyone to the table to help us build this community map? Um, and again, these footprints of existing data, can that be shared so that we can better constrain where the gaps are? Just a couple slide, a couple thoughts about new data acquisition. Um, again, this idea of polygons of coverage, we have the capacity to receive those in a variety of formats if people are able and willing to share that information. We could take consume web services, we can take tabular data and draw it on the map ourselves, we can take shape files, whatever people are able to produce and share. Um, and we also have developed in the context of Jebco a web application for people to come in and draw polygons identifying areas where they need data. So can draw an area, say this, this area should be mapped at this resolution, it's important for this region. Um, and as we gather more information from the global community, we can use that to help direct um, new expeditions, potentially opportunistic data acquisition as you know, weather or, or change in plans affects uh, availability while at sea, that kind of stuff. So rather than doing this randomly, we wanna be informed by information and the needs of the community. So, um, just a final thought is that I'd like for you to think about as we go through this webinar series is how can we work together to meet our common goals? Um, you know, CBID 2030 has these um, very bold aspirational goals of mapping the entire ocean and making this data available to the world. Um, but we really want to build a community of practice. We want to understand how we can work together, what kinds of tools or knowledge could be exchanged to help ensure that the rising tide lifts all boats, right? We really wanna make sure that this is a community effort where we all advance together. So think about if there are things that would help you, um, if it's information, if it's tools, if it's workflows, if it's just you know communication and collaboration, whatever it is, this is um, very important to us and something that we really wanna promote. And um, we think that that is going to help us move more quickly toward these common goals. So please let us know as you think about this. I think we're going to have a survey to circulate to you later to get some direct feedback. And with that, I think I will end and pass back to Tina. Thank you very much, Vicky, for that very insightful presentation. Um, our second presenter is Mika Odido from the UNESCO IOC Africa. So his presentation will remind us how intertwined are the activities for the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 
and seafloor mapping initiatives like the Nippon Foundation Jebko Seabed 2030 project. So go ahead, Mr. Mika, for your presentation. Thank you, Tina. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, I think, yeah, there you go. So thank you very much, Tina, uh, and uh, Vicky and the CBED team. Uh, I'd like to once again welcome all uh, participants in this webinar. Uh, which is organized in uh, collaboration with the CBED 2030 project. Uh, IOC uh, recognizes that uh, bathymetry is one of the most important, if not actually the most important uh, uh, parameters, uh, oceanographic uh, parameters. Uh, we, without uh, this parameter, uh, you would not really be able to do much in terms of uh, modeling. Uh, it, it, it influences, uh, uh, shipping lands, it influences uh, what type of species live in different parts of the of the ocean, it influences uh, circulation. So it's really quite an important uh, parameter to look at. And uh, that's why IOC also really focuses on, uh, on bathymetry. And I've been working closely with the IHP in the GEPCO initiative. I'll uh, first of all briefly introduce uh, IOC and these initiatives. Then I look at uh, the decade, like uh, uh, Tina said, and uh, highlight uh, some of the aspects of the decade that are uh, relevant to this work, especially for our region. Uh, first of all, uh, IOC is part of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and uh, Cultural Organization, which was established to contribute to the building of peace, the eradication of poverty, and sustainable development, and uh, general development uh, through through education, science, communication, and information. Uh, we have uh, five program sectors, uh, education, natural sciences, social and human science, culture, communication, and uh, information. And then of course, uh, one commission that is uh, IOC. And then we have uh, two of our arching global priorities that have to be taken in account in implementing all programs. That is Africa and uh, gender. Uh, as indicated, IOC is a commission within uh, UNESCO. Established in 1960, it focuses on uh, promoting ocean science and uh, building scientific knowledge, applying the knowledge for societal benefit, and uh, generally improving governance. We divide our programs into six functions which are interlinked, uh, starting with ocean research, observing system and data management, assessment, information for policy, early warning and uh, services, uh, sustainable management and governance, and of course, capacity development, which is a cross-cutting uh, uh, theme. Uh, we have uh, three sub-commissions, uh, one covering the Caribbean, one covering the uh, Western Pacific, and of course, uh, the, the one for Africa, which is uh, IOC Africa. Our program for the current period focuses on uh, five broad areas, ocean observations and monitoring, ocean science and assessments, data information management, capacity development and uh, governance, science policy interface and uh, awareness. I'll uh, briefly highlight some of the relevant areas that we have worked on in this region in, uh, in recent times. Uh, the first one is on uh, data archeology. span As you all know, over the years, uh, very many foreign uh, uh, research vessels have collected data along the coastal areas of Africa. And in many instances, this data has not been available in data centers or even in research organizations within the continent. So IOC has worked with several partners to try and trace this data and make it accessible and available to experts uh, from the region. We've especially focused at one stage on uh, data available from the ex-Soviet Union uh, states, which did quite a bit of work and uh, most of that data was not uh, digitized. So we worked with the US uh, National Oceanographic Data Center uh, to uh, 
to digitize most of this data and make it available to, to the centers within the region. The other area we've worked on is in uh, ocean oceanographic expeditions. Uh, we've worked together with the countries in the region to organize joint oceanographic expeditions that collected a reasonable amount of data uh, that can be used uh, for our purposes in the region. The other area we've worked on is uh, ocean atlases. For ocean atlases, we worked on uh, African coastal and uh, marine atlas, which mainly focused on uh, sourcing, collecting, and formatting marine geospatial data sets and making them available to marine scientists and managers. Uh, the objective was to improve access to data and to improve the capacity to use uh, this data. Our focus was mainly on uh, publicly available data. Uh, the thematic scope was uh, geosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, biosphere, human environment, and uh, base maps. So we divided the regions into the LAB region around the continent. And uh, in some instances, we also had work with the national teams to develop uh, national uh, digital atlases. Uh, the success of this in different countries depended on uh, the efforts that the countries put in it. Uh, some of them really went quite a bit with their developing their national atlases. Uh, however, in some of the countries, there were challenges due either to the capacities of the experts or even to the facilities that were available within the, within the countries. The other initiative that I'd like to highlight is the Ocean Info Hub that uh, we are currently implementing. These are three year project uh, commencing in April last year and funded by the government of Flanders in Belgium. It aims at uh, developing interoperability between existing information system, not to develop a new uh, data system. Uh, currently, as you may be aware, there are many different organizations and uh, groups that have established databases. Uh, in many instances, the databases, where well, you are not able to search the databases together. What we are looking at is how can we be able to develop a system that can, somebody can use to search at the same time uh, different databases managed by different uh, groups uh, globally. If our first focus will be on uh, the database that we have uh, highlighted uh, in the, on, the, on the screen. One is uh, people and institutions, uh, documents, uh, special data and maps, which are very relevant to this discussion, uh, trading opportunities, and uh, research vessels. Uh, like I already mentioned, the Ocean Info Hub will uh, facilitate better access to global data sets, uh, better visibility for regional and national data holdings. It will assist countries to report their, uh, in their reporting requirements for the different conventions and will support capacity development. Uh, of course, the opportunities that are available for collaboration with the info hub include capacity development, uh, data collection, building national data centers, and uh, ocean mapping uh, applications. I'll now highlight uh, a few issues uh, that are relevant to, in the framework of the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Why the Decade? The Decade provides a, with an opportunity to have a global collective research and investment framework to close knowledge gaps, a global framework to structure and boost scientific efforts at national and international levels to address global and regional sustainable development challenges. At the start of the planning for the decades, we looked at the challenges and the knowledge gaps that need to be addressed. One of the ones that was highlighted was, uh, was mapping. At the time that we began planning for the decade in the uh, beginning of 2018, only 5% of the sea floor had been mapped to high resolution. Like already indicated by uh, uh, Vicky, a lot of progress has been made due to the efforts by the Nippon project and the uh, seabed uh, 2030. And now we have 20% uh, of the ocean floor mapped to high resolution, which is a really big improvement. I think that's four times what we had at the, just uh, three years ago. So you can see what can be done if a lot of effort can be put in in a fairly short uh, time period. But this still compares poorly with the efforts that are, I mean, with the progress that has been made on mapping land and even on mapping the moon. We've mapped the moon to a much higher resolution that we have been able to map the, the sea floor. Uh, in the region, how, what, 
have we done to plan for the decade? We had a first regional uh, consultation on uh, uh, the decade uh, here in Nairobi at the beginning of last year, uh, where we had more than 140 participants from uh, 30 countries. We had pre preliminary discussions and a panel discussion of experts on uh, some of the areas that we had identified as, uh, as important uh, for our region. In all this discussion, data and mapping kept coming up. I've highlighted in red the results from the different uh, working groups, and you'll see that in almost all of them, uh, data and observations, data simulation, mapping, uh, developing common platforms for, for data management, all this kept coming up, uh, which really shows the importance that uh, our region uh, puts on data. Uh, I've tried to pick through the report and uh, highlight some of the issues that uh, related to data that uh, were highlighted. One was the need for an improved focus on user-driven data. Second, challenges in data sharing related to lack of common platforms or incompatible metadata and data formats. Third was lack of standardized policies in relation to open data access. Fourth was technical capacity and resource limitations. And fifth was lack of trust between organizations to share data. One thing that uh, the participant really emphasized was the sensitivity of data. Uh, the feeling was that there are very many groups coming in, flying in, picking data and flying out without involving uh, local institutions and local experts in uh, better managing and curating the data. So there was an emphasis on ensuring that we have system in Africa to manage data, we use African experts to manage data, but at the same time, we ensure that there's connectivity to the global uh, data landscape. Uh, we proposed several uh, actions to address some of these issues. Uh, developing an inventory of existing repositories, if it was to rescue and salvage data like uh, IOC had done in uh, earlier years, uh, standardizing the rules for clearing house mechanisms, uh, addressing lack of long-term continuous time series of data, uh, strengthening uh, national data centers or establishing them, uh, capacity development and investment in open source software and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges for skills uh, transfer. I think I'll leave it there. And, uh, uh, we will be able to discuss this more during the session on discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mika, for um, that very insightful presentation. I have seen a few questions in the chat. So as a remind, reminder, in the interest of the time, if you have questions, you are, uh, you are very, very welcome to post them in the Q&A section or in the chat. I've seen one in the chat. And then we will address them during the discussion session. Um, so thank you again, Mika, for your presentation. As mentioned earlier, this webinar will focus on a conversation to discuss knowledge of bathymetry mapping in the region, as well as stakeholder needs. So we have today um, guests in our panelists uh, to anim animate that discussion. So I will introduce First, uh, I, um, I will invite Mr. Israel Ashila to introduce himself briefly and uh, share with us his perspective on the importance of bathymetric mapping in the region. So Mr. Ashila, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Israel Ashila. I am a deputy director in the Geological Survey of Namibia. Um, perhaps for those um, who do not know where we are, uh, Namibia is uh, actually on the southwestern coast uh, of Africa, uh, bordering with Angola in the north and uh, South Africa in the, in the south. Uh, and we share uh, what is known as the Benguela current large marine ecosystem with the two countries. Um, I have been invited uh, through the Benguela Current Convention Secretariat 
um, by the IOC Subcommission for Africa uh, in the adjacent um, island states. I work for the Ministry of uh, Mines and Energy here. Uh, that's where the, the geological survey falls um, and um, represents uh, uh, sectors of mining, petroleum, geology, and energy. Uh, uh, the ministry covers uh, those areas, which are really um, users and um, potential users uh, for or, or of the bathymetric data. Um, in terms of the the status for bathymetric data uh, in Namibia, uh, we, we we have data in the public sector, uh, which is uh, with our fisheries ministry. Uh, our Ministry of Mines and Energy, which I represent. Um, however, some of the data uh, might be old. Uh, it's acquired as far back as 1911. Uh, and also some of it, uh, some inaccuracies uh, in the data was also uh, picked up in, the, in some data sets. Um, also, um, the, the the issue of the source of some of these data, since it comes really from uh, way back, uh, was not we were not able to trace some of the the, the source of, of some of these data. Uh, then we also have, of course, uh, recent but perhaps limited and restricted data um, in the in the industry, which is uh, mainly our extractive industry. Uh, we have a diamond mining. Um, operations in our, in our um, marine space that have been happening for some time. Of course, uh, they do utilize some bathymetric data there. Uh, and just to maybe sum up all the data sets that uh, I could identify so far is um, the data set with the geological survey where I sit, um, the data set uh, which is used by the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources. Uh, there is, of course, um, data that is uh, in the mining and petroleum industry. Uh, there was also some data that has been used before in um, some studies uh, in our waters coming from the South African Navy. Uh, and of course, um, the JEPCO uh, data. Now, apart from that, there is also um, hydroacoustic data, uh, which is available at the Surveyor General, really just for, for, for the depth. Uh, and this data was also used um, in verifying or checking some of the data sets that I've mentioned before uh, in terms of their accuracies. And some, some of the data sets were, were used, or some of these data sets that I've indicated here were used for um, a shoreline mapping project uh, in, back in 2007 uh, for the BCLME area. That's the Benguela current large marine ecosystem area. Um, and also, um, it was also used for the application of, um, of the extension of the Namibian um, EEZ. Um, now, in terms of the, the uses, of this data uh, for Namibia. Uh, we, we use it mainly in geological mapping. We use it um, in EIAs um, related to our extractive industries or as well as any other offshore projects really. Uh, we also do use this for mineral exploration and mining. Uh, when you have to design some mining tools, you really need uh, some bathymetry data to see the type of uh, uh, ocean surface you have. And also in, in some cases, uh, like in the industry to identify mineral traps that are obvious um, on, on the sea floor. Um, also, uh, this, is, this bathymetry data is also used in the petroleum exploration. Um, we do not yet have, we have not yet discovered any, but uh, uh, activities in the petroleum industry are really mainly still um, exploration. And also um, offshore renewable energy. Uh, this is a new area uh, that Namibia wants to look into. 
uh, we want to develop um, a wind farm offshore uh, simply because um, the area where we have wind, good wind regimes uh, on land, uh, it's actually a, a, a park, a national park. So um, to minimize impact in this national park, uh, the country is looking at uh, using the marine space uh, in that very area where the wind regime is good uh, so that they can put up wind farms. And really um, the first question that was asked by um, our national energy generating company was uh, if we have access or we have bathymetry data for them to know the depths they will be working with. And at the point, at the time, I, I did not even know where to point them, uh, which is an issue also that I will, I will just uh, highlight now. Um, apart from that also, of course, uh, research in mining and energy. So those are just some of the areas where we need uh, bathymetry data for just to highlight the need of having a good data set uh, for bathymetry. Um, in terms of the challenges, um, we think it, is, it will be important to have a centralized uh, host for uh, bathymetry data as a country. Uh, right now, the data is quite scattered uh, depending on, uh, on, on, on users, on various users some with fisheries, some with the geological survey, some with the industry. So we think if we could have a centralized uh, point or a database that hosts uh, this bathymetry data, um, it, it would do us good. Also, um, I would say data in government might in some cases be old, if data can be old, and also in, inaccurate at times. Uh, and sources of most of uh, our data, we could not really trace. So, um, however, recent data mainly acquired by the industry, there is data, might be, there is data acquired by the industry. Uh, however, it, uh, it is of course limited uh, to the areas uh, where the industry is operating. So it's not covering the entire offshore um, area of Namibia. In terms of the needs, uh, I think we would then, we would need um, surveying and mapping capacity locally, of course, maybe through um, collaborations with various local or international partners um, in order to acquire uh, new, new data for, for our marine space. And also, um, we need a centralized institutional database. This one I've already mentioned. A centralized place really um, to host this marine or this um, bathymetry data, which will be accessible, accessible to uh, all stakeholders. I, I thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashila for your answer for that first questions. So now I would invite Mr. Odido and Dr. Ferini to join us in the next section of our um, webinar, which is the discussion session. So just a reminder too, that since the webinar is recorded, um, it will be the recording will be shared to all participants and panelists um, after We've been we've processed the the rush of the, the recording, so please do not um, doubt about that. So we also have seen questions that have been answered in the Q and A section, um, and I still invite you if you have any question to either you keep them noted somewhere and then ask them live during the. To a quest, a discussion session or put them in the chat or in the Q&A section so we will be able to trust, trust them and answer them. So 
If Dr. Ferrini and Mr. Odidomika and Mr. Ashila, please, can you turn your video and mic on so we can start our um, discussion? Thank you. So um, following up on all the information we've received and discussed so far, the first question would be, what are the primary and potential uses of bathymetry data in your region? So I think it's more oriented to both Mika and uh, Israel. Mm. So please. The, 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 the potential use for bathymetric data are, uh, are many. I think al al already Israel has uh, mentioned some of them in his, uh, in his presentation. Uh, for, for shipping bathymetry is fundamental. Uh, you can't have any shipping without uh, bathymetry data. Uh, for offshore mining, you need uh, bathymetry data. For studies, uh, oceanographic studies, uh, you can't do any modeling without oceanographic data. Uh, even for uh, basic uh, areas like fishing, uh, bathymetry data is really, really crucial. You, you, the, the, the type of fish you get in, a, in, a, in an ocean area depends very much on the, on, on, on the bathymetry. So those are some of the areas that I, I can immediately uh, highlight. Maybe Vicky and Israel could also add on to this. Mm. Okay, yeah, I think, um, thank you very much. I have highlighted some of the areas before um, I have mainly focused on areas um, in the mining sector <clears throat> and petroleum and the energy, but of course uh, it's not limited to, to this only, perhaps it's just because uh, I'm coming from that background. Uh, but there are many, many uses really um, for your geological mapping, for your, there are traps. Uh, you need to see the morphology of your seabed to be able to know where some of the minerals like our diamonds would be trapped. This is one of the uses. Or for you to undertake a certain project, you need to do an EIA and for this you need um, to know the relief, your topography of, of, of your ocean floor. So all this information could really be acquired um, or by use of bathymetry data, just to mention a few. Yeah, so I would add that um, I like to think of bathymetry as the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the base map, it's the foundation upon which many, many things are built. Um, and if we can actually come together to produce a, you know, publicly shared open data set that everyone can use, it will allow us to um, conserve resources for uh, more advanced studies, for example. And so um, I think it's important and it's challenging to communicate to the world why bathymetry data is important, particularly as we step away from the coasts. Um, and so this is a common question that comes up and it's an important one for us as a global community to have a coherent message on sort of the, the elevator pitch as they call it, the, the two minute very concise message that you can deliver to anyone if you're only riding in an elevator with them for just a short time. Um, but yeah, I think the other important thing here is that because particularly with the UN decade, um, there will be a lot more coordination of uh, data acquisition for a variety of um, different disciplines and different studies. And if we can actually work together to ensure that different data types, not just bathymetry, bathymetry is what we're perhaps interested in, but water column data, every, everything, when, it, when the ships are out there collecting data, let's collect everything we can and share it so that we can take advantage of the fact that when the ship is there, it's a unique moment in time and space to make an observation. And by collecting those observations and sharing them, the global community benefits because we can make, we can better understand and manage our oceans. 
I sort of went on a little <laughs> detour there, but I think it's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you for that answers. Um, the next question that we have is related to probably opportunities. So the question is, what do you think are the biggest opportunities that the UN decade and CBET 2030 will bring for the region? So who would answer first? Mika, perhaps. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, the, the, we are really seeing the, the decade has been uh, transformative. Uh, you know, in, 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 the, in, in the early part of the, in the middle part of the last century, that's in the 1960s, there was a lot of investments in, um, in, in space in space science and a lot of benefits came from it we are able to get uh, new methods of uh, uh, studying space new methods of going to space the, the entire range of uh, space sciences uh, was really affected with this and uh, in, in recent years we've, we've seen that happen in, uh, in, 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 in electronics in uh, with mobile technology and all that uh, Ocean sciences are lagged lag behind. So we see the decade as providing an opportunity one to look at the, the technology. How can we improve the technology to be able to map the oceans at a much cheaper cost and a much more effective way? How can we improve the capacity in our countries uh, to be able to uh, undertake a bathymetric, uh, bathymetric mapping? How can we better produce maps. I mean, some of this was shown in one of the slides that uh, uh, Vicky had towards the, last, the end of her presentation. The improvements in computing capacities, the improvement in capacity, the ways that we look at uh, and visualize the, 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 the data from the, from the oceans. Uh, and uh, more important to me is the engagement. The engagement of the local populations, the engagement of institutions in our region, the engagement of researchers, the engagement of our governments. For me, this would really, really, really be important. How can we better use of make use of bathymetry? How can we improve the collection of uh, bathymetry data? Those are the things that I see as uh, looking at in the in the in the in the, in the decade. Yeah. Um, on my side, I, I really. Um, I think it will um, harness the potential for, for, for the ocean uh, in terms of um, well, resources that are out there. Um, and also uh, it, will, it will help in um, avoiding or, 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 or resolving some conflicts um, over some sectors that are operational at, at sea. Uh, we have uh, cases um, around also, of course, uh, in Namibia, where most of the sectors are making headway into the ocean now. Um, but because of um, the space is not um, properly shared, uh, some conflicts have come about between sectors. So I believe the, uh, this would bring about um, proper research uh, into our ocean and the seafloor and be able really to put in efforts um, to coordinate our efforts from various sectors uh, once um, the ocean becomes um, our, has our attention through this uh, decade. So I would add that, um, so I've been part of JEBCO for a long time. And uh, what is most inspiring about the Jebco community is their passion to work together, to come across from different cultures and different language, work through those barriers and work toward a common goal. Um, and I think that the critical piece, the critical ingredient that will lead to the greatest success 
in both what the decade is trying to achieve and what CBED 2030 is trying to achieve, the key ingredient is the people and figuring out how to come together as a community that has trust, that works together, shares knowledge, shares skills, shares ideas, shares data. Um, that's, I think, one of the most exciting things for me, and I think it will have the longest impact. Yes, all the work scientifically that we're aspiring to do, both in CBED 2030 and with the UN Decade is important for humanity. Um, and that's of course a major driving um, factor here. But as we come together and bridge these gaps and bring communities together to and learn how to work together, um, it's going to really advance us tremendously, I think, because, and, and we sort of have to, right? Like the, the, the decade is happening, not just because it's a great idea, but it's also necessary. This is a time in, in, our, in our history that it's really important to do these things. And so we're challenged to do this. I think we're up for the challenge. I think it's a wonderful thing to try to figure out how to work together and build this trust and build this community. And I'm really excited that we have everyone on this call today starting to have a broader conversation and starting to build a bigger community. But I must also say that I have, I have some worry and concerns. The, the African Union declared the period 2050 to 2025 as the African decade of oceans and seas. Uh, declaring the decade is not enough. We really need to work on making it happen. Thank you. Um, so since we've been talking about engagement, I guess the next question has probably have been a little bit discussed. Um, it is about how can the UN decade and CBET 2030 and probably that African decade for ocean science, um, how does um, institute, I mean, project and initiatives strengthen the communities that already work in the region I mean, towards bathymetry mapping? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I also don't think I'm the one to answer it. <laughs> yes. Do, do you want to repeat the question perhaps, yeah? Yes, I will. So how can the UN decade and see the 2030 strengthen the communities already working in this region? I, I, I see both initiatives as providing a platform. Uh, a platform for the communities to engage, a platform to share experiences, a platform to share resources, a platform to share infrastructure. Uh, so for, for me, the, the, this really is the, is, is the most important uh, uh, contribution that uh, both the DCAD and, uh, and uh, the CBED uh, uh, project uh, uh, do provide. Uh, like I said, we have to have uh, that engagement from the from the from the region and from the stakeholders. Otherwise, just declaring a decade is not enough to get things moving. Like I said, the African decade of oceans and seas has been going on for five years, and we don't have much to show for it. Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, it will bring about uh, coordination uh, of efforts. Um, with um, others that are working within the, 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 the area and also um, from other parts. Um, I think uh, it, it would really assist them um, in, in that sense. Uh, so they will become part of a bigger community, I think, um, would be an advantage of, um, of these two initiatives. <clears throat> Thank you, Vicky. You said you won't answer, but if you have anything. I think I already covered it. All right. <laughs> um, probably the, uh, the last question for this um, part of our webinar, since we are coming close to start the question and answer um, part. Um, how, so I think it's gonna be a little 
going backwards, but still, what are the greatest challenges with respect to bathymetry data? For example, barriers to data sharing, gaps in data coverage. Um, if you can elaborate more, or if you have suggestions in how to solve that, maybe. The question was, uh, what are the greatest challenges with respect to bathymetry data? In, for example, barriers to data sharing or gaps in data coverage. I think maybe I could mention that uh, some of these have been highlighted already, especially by Israel. I think he did he mentioned quite a bit of this in his presentation. One is uh, access, having the data. Uh, in many places along our coastline, the data is just not there. So you cannot share what you do not have. Uh, then uh, secondly, knowing where the data is, uh, where the data is available, uh, who holds it, and uh, trust trust in uh, exchange of data. Uh, still, we have a lot of holding on to holding on to to data. Uh, mm -hmm. In some instances, not in a bad way, because uh, for some of them is that they like to tell a story out of their data. They don't want someone to tell the story before they do. Uh, oh, when you are developing uh, one of our earlier data projects, I had a mission around the countries of the region. And uh, in one of the institutions I visited, we, we had a long chat presentation and just on uh, data management generally. Then uh, at some stage, I mentioned the possibility of uh, uh, working on uh, people getting the, uh, not just the facilities, but also the skills to tell a story out of their data. And for many of them, this was the highlight of the discussion. So how, how can they get the skills to tell a story from their data? You find somebody has a, Locker full of that. I mean, he has them on paper, he has them on CDs, but he just doesn't know how to tell a story from the data. But he knows that if he releases it, somebody will uh, publish several papers from it without uh, acknowledging it. And this really is a big barrier to, to the, the sharing of data. People mm -hmm. would like to tell a story from their data and be acknowledged for the work they did. Yeah, also just to add and perhaps even to repeat some of the uh, challenges there, it is really the fact that um, in most cases, this data is not a shared resource. Um, it is quite um, scattered and it's very difficult uh, to, to trace just where this data is. Um, different institutions would um, have bits and pieces of it, uh, depending of course on their needs uh, so, so, so I think really it would be helpful if this data is uh, centralized in a, a, a certain point or institution where we all stakeholders know where to find uh, these data sets. Uh, so some of the data sets, of course, um, I would say the inaccuracies that comes with it and not knowing when it was uh, surveyed and all these things. Uh, are some of the issues uh, that, that we do have. Um, I think for me, those are really the key challenges that I would say um, I have experienced uh, here in Namibia. So I've been in the, in the profession of data management and data sharing for uh, a while, <laughs> certainly more than a decade, probably close to two. Um, and I think that, you know, in the US where I sit, we have um, pretty clear data policies for open data sharing. Um, it's mandated by the, the grant making agencies. The culture has adapted slowly, um, but it has been adapting. Um, a lot of these same issues of scientists wanting to hold their data so they could publish on it before anybody else. We're starting to see a culture change around that. And I think technology is helping. I think a really important thing here is trust. It's also acknowledgement of um, the effort that goes into creating, acquiring and creating data products. 
So attribution and acknowledgement of effort is critically important. In the science community, we're seeing effort there in terms of citation of data, um, but that doesn't extend to all communities. But I think the foundation is there and the principles are there. And as a community, a global community, it's on all of us to ensure that credit is given and acknowledged um, when working with other people's data. That's certainly a guiding principle in the JEPCO community and in the JEPCO project and in CBED 2030. Um, you know, what we're doing to build this global map is we are leveraging the efforts of countless individuals and organizations and it would be completely inappropriate for us to take credit for their work. We have to acknowledge them and make sure that they are recognized for their contributions. Um, I had a whole bunch of notes of all these things that came up like as we're talking and I'm not sure where to go next, but I think that that's a really important thing. Um, and you know, I hope that what we can do as we learn to work together is find ways to address some of these technical problems, work to bring disparate data sets that are scattered and not well stewarded together to make them accessible first and foremost to the community who needs access to them in the region for the work that they're doing, and then ultimately feeding that out into global syntheses that can help a broader community do um, research and management as appropriate and necessary. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a few questions to start our Q&A session. Um, so first we'll go through the questions that has been asked in the Q question and answer um, section. And then please, the attendees can raise their hands uh, from no one to ask the question. So if you hit, if you click the hand symbol on your screen, then our team will track them and we'll give you the mic to ask the question. So we have first a question from um, Commander Christoph Tennyson. I hope I say the name right. Uh, so several African states are dependent on external states for the charting of their oceans. The data and information should be available from those primary charting authorities when approached. For example, um, South Africa is the primary charting authority for Namibia and any data requirements can be requested from South Africa. So I guess it was more a statement, but if um, Commander would um, elaborate the question, oh, I see Haley would like to answer the question live. I can make a statement in response to that. Um, I think the first step toward that is understanding where to go and who to ask. Um, you know, we don't, we're not embedded in the community. We don't know all the right people. And so taking as much knowledge and guidance from this community that's come together today and, and your extended communities to help us navigate um, how to most effectively uh, approach people who have the data and who would be um, the ones that would be able to share it. Uh, that's hugely important. So I think gathering this information, any input you can provide on who we should talk to, who we could talk to about data, um, then we can follow up to, to make those requests and have that conversation. Right. So I hope uh, if you have any question, please hit the Raise your hand. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mercy um, May. Um, sorry. Um, so she's a current PhD candidate. Her is uh, my research are area is focusing on seabed mining governance. What are the opportunities for researchers in this area? <laughs> yeah. Um, perhaps I can attempt that one. Um, I think there definitely are opportunities um, to go into that. Um, perhaps building already on the existing legislations. Um, I, I would say most of our legislations, like uh, we do uh, 
mining, but it was mainly focused on the land mining uh, since uh, marine mining is only become really increasing now. So I think there are opportunities to really go in and uh, look at issues of um, maybe improving the legislation um, in terms of um, governance for, 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 for mining uh, generally. I think there is room uh, for that in that space. Any more comments or answer? Right. Um, the next question from Zakari Sohu: How to access those? To, how to access to this data collected? Unfortunately, no data for shallow water. Then it's necessary to develop in situ project with shallow, we which allow to collect this data with a small boat. So that's a great question that I think um, relates, at least in part, to the crowdsourced bathymetry um, effort that has been uh, begun. We're going to hear more about that at the next session. Um, but basically, there is work being done uh, with a working group from the IHO to develop the standards and also um, the, the data pipelines for acquiring bathymetry data with simple navigational sonars and feeding that data into the IHO data center for digital bathymetry and making that available. And so this is a way that we can equip small, very small vessels with very simple technology to collect data as they are moving around in shallow or even deeper, hard to reach places um, and really take advantage of that opportunity. So the way that I like to sort of look forward is I, I think about, you know, we're, we're moving toward a model where any boat that is equipped with a navigational sonar, including my little boat that I go fishing with out in the, in the bay, can actually acquire and contribute meaningful data. That is definitely underway. We'll hear more about that at the next session. Um, it's being prototyped in a bunch of different places, including South Africa right now. Um, so um, I think that's a, an emerging technology that's going to be a game changer and uh, uh, it's moving very quickly and it's a very exciting. Uh, evolution. So we'll keep you, Vicky. We have a few questions uh, for you. So we have one from Amon Kimbeli from Kenya. Um, most ports, RMC waves are mapped to very high resolution in Africa, evident from navigation charts, and even some offshore areas. Unfortunately, most of these data are not accessible. What is the BAT2030 plan in getting some of the underlying BATI data for public consumption and collection within the JEPCO grid? Yeah, so I think this, um, this goes back to something I said earlier, which is, you know, the ocean is huge. There's a lot of different uh, stakeholders who have data that they may be willing to share. And so working with the community who is connected to those people and figuring out how to um, approach people and talk to them about data that exist and initiate the conversation about what, what their terms of sharing the data are, right? So one of the things that I've become very aware of in the last year is um, just the word data means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so sometimes if we say data, people immediately say, oh, we can't share with you the full resolution every, all, every sounding. Um, and you know that's, that's okay. If people are comfortable sharing a gridded version of the data, a lower resolution version of the data, any version of the data is better than... Sorry, I was kicked out of the meeting. It looks like we're just experiencing a couple of technical difficulties. Uh, I think Vicky is frozen. 
Um, you look fine though, Tina. All right, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so until Vicky come back to us, uh, we can still for, uh, continue, uh, I think. Um, we have one of our attendees had a question. Uh, I hope you can still hear me. Um, please, can uh, Shan Fennessy, if you, can you please um, turn your mic on and go ahead with your question? Uh, thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> perhaps uh, Vicky uh, could comment, but I'm sure Israel has had some exposure to this. So the Norwegian vessel, the Dr. Fritof Nansen, has done several surveys uh, around the African continent um, and has some very sophisticated acoustic equipment on board. I'm curious to know to what extent um, any of that data has already been analyzed or made available to the Seabed 2030 JEPCO um, programs and projects? Um, I, I, I will have to say, um, um, yes, I think I'm aware of um, the research that might have taken place there, but, but um, to what extent the data has been used, I, I would have no idea. I, I, we do have um, the Severe General Office here in Namibia that uh, deals mostly with uh, acoustic data. Um, I would have to, to liaise with them uh, on that to really know uh, the progress made on that. As of now, I do not, I would not have any uh, information on that. Sorry. Hi, Vicky. Uh, welcome back. I'm back. I lost power and internet, but I'm using my phone right now. Oh. <laughs> no idea why the storm has not yet come. Um, I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> um, so you were answering Amon's question, but we also have a question from Sean Fennessy. So please, Sean, if you would like to um, re-ask the question for Vicky. Um, thanks. Yes, so I was asking about the, the Norwegian vessel, the Dr. Fritof Nansen, <clears throat> excuse me, um, has done extensive surveys around the African continent um, with very powerful acoustic equipment. Um, and I was just wondering to what extent those data have been already analyzed or made available to the JEPCO Seabed 2030 project and program. So to the best of my knowledge, and Tina and Haley can fill in, um, I, we haven't seen that data yet. So um, that would be a good uh, connection for us to follow up on to see if there's a possibility of gaining access to that in some form. Maybe I could uh, also add a comment on that. Uh, the Fridge of Nansen has a policy of uh, providing data through the countries that they have collected data in their waters. So if you want data from a waters of a specific country, they will only give you, when you request through the relevant uh, uh, Nansen focal point in the, in the respective country. Concerning the other uh, data sets, we had planned to organize a, a workshop on environmental data analysis uh, with the Nansen program. Uh, last year in uh, Maputo, uh, but because of the uh, pandemic, we had to postpone this. We are still discussing with them whether to have uh, uh, this training uh, 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 online, because it's unlikely that uh, uh, for the rest of the year, the travel will be possible in any meaningful way. I, okay, so I am reading one of the questions in our section uh, from Sari Abdullahi, who is from Senegal. He, I have participated in several acoustics surveys in Africa with science scientific eco sounders and using fit of Nansen vessel or our national vessel Etafteme. How do you integrate acoustic data in, our, in your project to improve mapping bathymetry around the ocean? So I think that the simplest answer to that question is um, we are working to integrate 
all data we can. Um, that could be multi-beam data. It could be um, bathymetry data derived from seismic surveys. It could be single beam data. It could be crowdsourced bathymetry. It could be satellite derived data in shallow waters. Whatever data are available and it, you know, effectively in whatever format they're available, we're happy to try to work with the data owners um, to evolve that data into a format that is shareable and integratable. Um, we certainly get more coverage with multi-beam data than we do with single beam data, but any data, again, is better than no data. So whatever we can integrate will help us improve the model and will increase the coverage from 20%, hopefully to 100 in the next decade. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just saw the last, uh, Sari Abdullahi also mentioned that uh, he is the focal point of the Nansen program in Senegal. So we have more opportunities here to pin to the, those data set from the Nansen uh, feature of service. Um, so I will keep screening in the Q&A question since we don't have any attendees uh, raising their hands. So, sorry, I'm really going through it. Uh, from Combo Muero, we agree that bathymetry is essential to map the oceans and expand the possibilities to exploit the seabeds for the benefit of the countries with ocean space. The challenge that we face as Africa community is lack of capacity on manpower. How do we increase capacity in the region so as to empower the region? In accessing the wealth in the ocean? So I think there's a couple of different ways to answer this. Um, one obviously is I'm afraid we are losing Vicky again. Um, you know, community development and capacity development next time. But Tina mentioned that the Nippon Foundation, Jepco, says I'm still connected. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Am I there? Yes, okay. you are. So training programs. Um, I, I should also add that Jebco is currently establishing a subcommittee focused on training. So we recognize as a global initiative that there is a need. Um, and we are trying to coordinate the community to help deliver uh, what's necessary to help with training and capacity development in that context. Another mechanism for capacity development um, could be, uh, you know, ships of opportunity that are passing through coastal waters. If clearance and approval is given for those vessels to acquire data and to provide that data to the nation and also to the world, um, it's a small way, but it's a way to help increase coverage and increase capacity by um, leveraging existing funded activities that are um, nearby and taking place. Maybe you could also mention the training program run by the Nippon Foundation. The Nippon Pogo the training program. I've, I've seen on the list of us that we have at least four people who have attended that training program. So right. Tina, do you want to talk about the training program? Yes, I can briefly talk about it. Um, so I joined the training program back in 2016. Uh, it gathers uh, six students from different countries in the world. And it is a 12 month project where you learn about uh, seabed mapping. Uh, yes, seabed mapping, including um, planning, processing data, and creating projects related to Bathymetry mapping. Um, during the 12 months, we had theoretical um, classes. And then we have a part of the training that put all your knowledge in practice. We call it summer hydro, during which you would be teamed up with different students and um, create a project to map a certain region nearby the, the university. I mean, the the university, sorry. Um, so it is a program that you can apply every year. I guess the applications are not yet open for this 2021, 
but you can check and keep an eye on the net, the website, the chebco.net website to look up for that period of application. Uh, I can tell from the attendee list that we have, I hope she's still there, we have other alumni and I can tell that from the African region, we have several alumni. Uh, Mr. Sorry, I'm going to call names, but I think it is important that the community, community knows that we can access the program and we can get involved either in JEBCO or in the CIBA 2030 project. So we have Amon Kimali who has asked questions and also I think she's not here, but we have, oh, she's there. Hi, Victoria. Victoria Obura from Kenya. We also have a alumni from Angola. Unfortunately, he is not here today, but we hope he can join the next session. And also from Mauritius. We also have alumni from South Africa who are now involved uh, in Map the Gaps, who is hosting our webinar today. And our, the actual director of the Nippon Foundation JEPCO training is an alumni from the training. So obviously, we all have our role and place to join in this huge initiative. Um, so I've seen in the chat, yes, it's posted there in the link to the JEPCO training. And also we have a JEPCO alumni group, uh, from which is Map the Gaps. So yes, we are here and we hope that more people from the region can join us. Um, all right, so back to our question and answer. I think we have another question for you, Vicky. Um, I feel like I'm taking the stage while it's supposed to attend this asking question. So if Errol Wiles is still around, please ask your question live. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vicky. Um, yeah, so I was in contact with you, Vicky, by email um, a while back, speaking about the work that SIAB does through ASAP um, in collecting smaller regions relatively um, of, of bathymetry data. Uh, and then you mentioned now something about um, the shallow water initiative you have uh, going in a trial in South Africa. Um, is you know, are you are you able to share any more information or details about that? Um. So um, yeah, this is the crowdsourced bathymetry uh, effort. Um, yep. So basically, the I'll give a little bit of my overview, and uh, if any of the other people involved are still on the line, they can also speak up. But basically, the IHO has been working to um, get this effort uh, off the ground. And there um, are data loggers that are being deployed in a prototype sort of capacity to acquire data and deliver it to the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. The resolution of that data far exceeds the resolution goals of CBED 2030. And certainly the data density in most cases will be single beam. So it will be relatively sparse compared to multi-beam, but the value of these data is still recognized as um, something that can help to validate existing nautical charts. Um, if something tremendous changes, like a container falls off a ship, maybe we'll detect it in crowdsource bathymetry. The workflows are evolving. The data access is evolving. It's recognized as an important resource. Another example of crowdsource bathymetry that I can give you is um, there's a company called Olex, um, which has for many years had a system of crowdsourcing bathymetry data from I think primarily fishing vessels. And they aggregate that data. And if you're part of that system and you pay into it, I think you gain access to the data, but they have delivered to Jebco um, a version of the data compilation that they have generated. It is of course also again, lower resolution than full resolution, but it does cover significant areas. So. 
the, the concept has been proven that with enough data loggers acquiring data over a common area, the data can be brought together into a meaningful product. And so the idea with this crowdsource bathymetry effort is really to, to scale that out and figure out ways to accelerate the transformation of that data into relevant and, and useful data products. Okay, great, thanks. Um... And maybe I can drop you an email just to find out more about it, and maybe sure. we can contribute to that um, some way uh, in the future. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we still have one question that is related to crowdsource bathymetry, um, but I feel like it has been answered. But I will let you, Vicky, add more if there is more to uh, to add to it. Yeah, so I think um, the the IHO definition of crowdsourced bathymetry is fairly specific, and it does refer largely to the shallower water sort of navigational sonar uh, da derived data. Um, if we sort of broaden the concept of crowdsourced or the way that we describe it, you know, you could consider the entire Seabed 2030 and Jebco project to be a crowdsourced project, but by the IHO definition, it is a bit different. So I like to cast Jebco and Seabed 2030 as a community sourced project. Um, so a lot of the data that you see, if you look at the global map um, and the coverage, a lot of what's been mapped is from research vessels transiting from port to study site. So there's a lot of uh, concentration of coverage coming in and out of ports. Um, what we'll see with crowdsourced bathymetry as that becomes more important is that certain parts of the ocean are traveled more frequently. And so that kind of data will be easier to acquire and assemble for certain parts of the ocean. So again, if we sort of step back and look at this problem as a whole, everything that we can bring to bear is going to be necessary, right? This is an all hands on deck sort of approach that we're coming up with to bring every data type from every possible kind of source together and figure out how to integrate it. And recognizing that some parts of the ocean are frequently traveled and will be easier to map. Some parts are less frequently traveled and will be harder, maybe because of uh, conditions, you know, could be just sea state, could be ice. There's a bunch of different variables that come into um, the accessibility and um, ability to map different parts of the ocean. Uh, but what I think we can make hopefully good progress on is uh, by bringing the community together, really trying to describe the need and the rationale for why it's important to share data about the shape of the seafloor. Um, and figuring out how to bring everyone to the table so that they can contribute to this, this global effort. Um, getting that part taken care of is something that we can do readily through community building and capacity building. And that's where we can help to set the stage for the rest of it. And the challenges of data acquisition and technology will be addressed as time moves on, but really trying to get the community part and the clearances and the approvals and the acknowledgement and the sharing in place, that's the first place to start, I think. Thank you, Vicky. So we are full rolling in the Q&A session. Uh, we still have some time to discuss. We have two attendees who raised their hands. So let me just find. So we have um, Commander Tennyson, if you... Please go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I just want to like uh, get back to Mr. Wiles, um, his question about the trial that we're doing in South Africa. Um, just a quick by means of introduction, I'm the Assistant National Hydrographer at the SNAV Hydrographic Office. Um, and we have embarked upon a crowdsource bathymetry trial um, pilot project um, quite recently in conjunction with the um, Institute for Maritime Technology. So if there's any information that you would like from us, you're more than welcome to get um, in contact with us um, by email um, or even a phone call. Um, our details are available on our website. So you're more than welcome to contact us there if you've got some more information. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. That's very informative. Um, Dr. Dr. Diagana, please, if you um, unmute yourself and ask your question. You are on, Dr. Diagana. Okay, um, so we will come back to you right after because we have another question coming in. So if I'm on, go ahead with your question. Hi, hello, you can hear me? Yes, we are. So I just wanted to maybe this is for Mika and Vicky, because I'm aware of IOC's plan to reactivate the uh, development of the African Coastal and Marine Atlas, which was initially done through the Odin Africa uh, framework. So I don't know how we are going to synergize between projects that have similar objectives, because with my experience during the first African Marine Atlas, you find that when countries participate in such kind of pro uh, projects, then the willingness of uh, submission of the data and also the sharing of the data becomes even easier. So I don't know how we'll synergize both the upcoming redevelopment of the African Marine Atlas together with the objective of achieving the seabed 2030 as we go forward. So um, I, from my perspective, um, it's much easier for us as Seabed 2030 to integrate data products that have been built by coalitions or regional groups or projects or efforts. And so if there is momentum in the region to build bathymetric data products as part of this effort that you just described, that's wonderful. And we can, uh, we can leverage and work with that rather than having to go all the way down to the source. So again, that, that graphic that I showed of sort of national efforts driving, regional efforts driving global, we don't wanna repeat anything. We don't want to um, put unnecessary requests or work on people. If there are efforts already underway to build products that can be shared, then you know, from my perspective, that's a wonderful, uh, uh, situation and it's a great way for us to be able to move more quickly because we can work with that uh, product that's being generated. All right. Maybe this this is something that uh, uh, we could also reflect on further because uh, uh, the session next week will now focus on uh, collaboration, on uh, working together to achieve the objectives of uh, CBA 2030. So maybe you could reflect on this over the next few days. Then, uh, when we come when we come back next week, we can discuss this further and look at uh, how we can work together on this and which are the other initiatives that are ongoing in the region that will be able to work together. What sort of mechanisms should we put in place as a region to be able to improve uh, uh, seabed mapping in the region? All right. Uh if Dr. Diagana, one more better luck, probably. Otherwise, you can type the question in the chat and we'll go back to that to, to be answered. Okay, uh, we still have someone with the hand raised. Okay, go ahead, um, Commander. Um, yeah, this is just a, a comment also on the discussions that we're planning on on having um, next week. I'll be I've been given a, a invite by um, Dr. Farina as well to give a bit of oversight and just to give an indication of what that pilot project that I alluded to entails, um, where it comes from, what we'll be doing, um, some challenges that we've had up until now, and also pretty much just an invite and a request from everyone that can assist in this project um, to please contact the SA Navy Hydrographic Office 
um, to set up a meeting or if there's any questions or comments. So hopefully by next week when we when we see each other again, um, I'll be able to shed some project on uh, or some light on the project that that we've embarked on um, for CBET 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have already started to engage towards our mission here. Um, so right now we have no more questions so far and no more hands raised. So last shot for anyone still in the session. If you have any question, raise your hand or put it in the chat. Okay, so let me yeah, just- Maybe try up delay again. Yes. Okay, I just ask you to unmute. There you go, we can hear you. Hello? Yes, hi, welcome. Yeah, they have a little a little mistake because I'm not uh, Abulai. Oh. My name is Professor Afia. That is why when you oh. call upon me, I didn't understand, yeah. All right. <laughs> hi, Mika and everybody. <laughs> So uh, it's not a question, but uh, just uh, a comment. Uh, we all concur that uh, we experience a lack of vision in Africa to draw biometric map. But one can recognize that uh, there are several maps uh, which are drawn up for various needs, which are often in pre, 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 private structure or even in public structure. The issue is how to get these maps. And once we get it, how to solve the scale and the resolution issue so that we can tie this map each together to draw a, a general map, multimeter map for Africa. That is my comment. So anyone who wants to reflect or have anything to add? Yeah, I think the question of scale is a, is a really fascinating one. Um, I think that if we can evolve as a global community toward a concept of having higher resolution data accessible, uh, source data accessible, we will be able to meet the evolving and emerging needs of stakeholders as technology allows us to rapidly produce on-demand data products. Right now, the situation is that data are so sparse at a global scale that we're really just trying to put the pieces together wherever they exist. Um, but if we have an eye toward the future and don't just build a product that meets the goals of a particular project, such as Seabed 2030, um, and really try to make sure that we, we organize, we centralize, we document the data that exists so that as the technology becomes more available and we can bring people to the data in the cloud, for example, we will have much more opportunity to produce the kinds of products that meet the needs of a broad user community, right? So 100 meter resolution in shallow water, shallower than one and a half kilometers is still very coarse resolution. Um, and it won't meet the needs of a lot of stakeholders, but the data that is necessary to build that 100 meter resolution grid in the shallower water will be able to meet the needs of more stakeholders. So really having a, an eye toward our sort of 10 year goal of having at least something, some data representing the whole seafloor, but really preparing ourselves for the next generation and having data accessible so that we can produce whole new products that meet the needs of a broad user community, I think is again, one of the very exciting things about what we're trying to do here. We're trying to really future-proof um, for generations to come access to these kinds of data. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I've seen, I've checked the time and we are close to finish our session, but really one last shot for anyone who has a question.
All right, if no one has a question, I would like to thank you all again. Thank you for our panelists and my apologies again. Oh, sorry, someone raised hands. I didn't see it. So if Nelzadek or Sori can unmute. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Yes? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize for coming in late. I had completely misunderstood the timing. My comment is, is actually a, a request. My comment is a request, not a question. Are you able to send circulate to the recording so that I can benefit from it? Because I came very late. I'm very sorry about that. Thank you. Yes, we will. Uh, and we will share both the recording and the slides from the presentations. And we are very glad that you were able to join us today. Um, so one last shot at hand raised. Okay, so if no one has any last questions, um, we are coming to conclude our webinar. Um, thank you all our panelists and our speakers um, for sharing your opinion and your insight on the current status of seabed mapping in the region today. Um, thank you also to attendees who have raised very important and very um, good questions that will help us shape probably the strategy for our next session. And um, if, sorry, if our panelists and speakers would like to have a last word for today's session before we wrap up. I would just like to thank everyone also. Um, it's been great having uh, an initial conversation and we look forward to continuing the conversation next time and beyond. Uh, we will hear from several people uh, in the next webinar with updates on various mapping activities. So we'll continue some of this conversation then. And then as Mika said, we're going to really start to talk about how we can work together to, to reach these goals and that includes capacity building, et cetera. So please think about what kinds of needs you might have, ideas for capacity development, et cetera. Um, I think we're going to circulate a short survey to attendees to get some feedback from, from everyone. And then um, certainly I look forward to our next conversation next week. Uh, to add on to uh, what Vicky has requested, uh, over the, the week, we can also please reflect on uh, what really are the gaps that uh, we need to address in our, in our region? How can we make uh, use of the decade to really improve uh, mapping in the region? Uh, think big uh, and uh, let us uh, maybe harmonize it once we discuss, but uh, really, really think big. One of, one of the problems we normally have in our is that uh, we normally don't think big. We think in terms of a workshop here, a workshop there, that is not helping our region. Please really reflect on how we can really assist our region to map the sea floors around Africa. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to say uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you for the um, fellow uh, panelists and also the great questions that came from um, the attendees, really. Um, I think it's uh, generally a good initiative um, and uh, we are also looking forward to be part of it, um, to learn um, from others and to contribute uh, what we can to the initiative. Thank you. Professor Afia. Uh, thank you very much. I think that it was a very good initiative. I think that uh, uh, but metric is uh, very important for everything we do in the ocean. So all these initiatives towards how to, to get but metric is cut are very important. So 
we are doing everything we can to, to push and uh, see how we can get all our ocean in Africa covered by mathematic charts. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So again, we will send and circulate both the slides and the recording and a short survey for you to give us your opinion on today's webinar and your ideas to map the seafloor around Africa. And hope to see you all next week. Right. Bye-bye. Yeah.